Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, Old Testament History Session 3. Hello, God. The Bible reads in Genesis 1 1 In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the earliest Hebrew manuscripts, the first word probably was God, Elohim. God created everything. When was that? In the beginning. <laughs> Let's talk about this a bit. For now, we exist as believers in God in an ever increasingly agnostic world. So what should we say about that? Do we merely resist and stay mute and just maintain our faith by blind faith? How can we when there's evidence all around us of a loving creator who's everywhere present, all powerful and all knowing? I say, speak up. So to get off on the right foot in the Old Testament, we need to start here. God created everything. Everything we know of. Now, scientists may disagree, but all they have to offer are theories. The subtitle for the following is Moses was not an astrophysicist. The sub subtitle is A Kick in the Astrophysicist. I come from a family of scientists and teachers. My father was a self taught scientist, a naturalist, ornithologist, zoologist, and ecologist who amassed enough knowledge to have a 10 year long daily, Monday through Friday afternoon TV show on nature on WSPD TV, Toledo, Ohio. It began in 1947. And then he also produced a collection of 50,000 35 millimeter color slides of nature, some of which he used in lecturing in elementary schools all over the Midwest for another 15 years. One of my sisters became a college professor of botany. My other sister and her husband operated the largest concessions and campgrounds facilities out west in the U.S. National Park System. So science is in my DNA. Before I became interested in the Bible, I lived and breathed science. For example, during middle school, I once did a photo microscopy project of taking pictures of microscopic creatures collected from a pond behind my house. It was not for school. I just got interested in it and figured out how to do it. Chemistry, physics, and biology were my friends when I had no other humans of that status. That all changed when I started attending Bible fellowships, but I retained my curiosity and analytical approach, which has helped me with Bible research. I have long believed that one must view Genesis 1 from the perspective of an ancient mindset, not modern. Moses was not an astrophysicist. Therefore, he would not have comprehended the concepts that we now know today about physics, astronomy, and the sciences. But Moses still was very intelligent, having received the world's best available education in the Egyptian court. They knew about observational astronomy, as evidenced by the alignment of the pyramids and other buildings, but many of the concepts of particle physics or nuclear fission would still probably have been alien to Moses, nor would the believers he was communicating to understand or accept them, even if Moses could comprehend them. Yet, Moses wrote down Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What was the purpose of Genesis 1? In one word here, in my PowerPoint uh, presentation, is cosmology. Those of you on the playback can look at slide number 2. That's the number down there in the right corner. An internet lookup of the definition of the word cosmology 
yields the following definition. The science of the origin and development of the universe. Modern astronomy is dominated by the Big Bang Theory, which brings together observational astronomy and particle physics. In other words, it is, how did all this around us get here? That is one of the fundamental concepts that defines sentience. Here's the other word up there. The, the internet says that sentience is a multidimensional, subjective phenomenon that refers to the depth of awareness an individual possesses about himself or herself and others. That, in other words, is the mental capability to reflect upon who am I and how did I get here? Now, we all may not throw around those big words like that, but still we wonder about such things, don't we? So that is what Genesis 1 explains. Cosmology. But it is not expressed in modern terms. It is expressed in ancient terms. Terms. Today, 3,500 years after this was written down in Genesis, we have to realize something about it. First of all, who was it written to? Ancient folks, right? Did they take science class in middle school? No. Did they know what the stars were? No. But the stars dominated half their lives. How could anyone possibly think that they would not have developed some kind of explanation, right or wrong, about them? You see, even though they did not possess the basic knowledge of the sciences that we have today, they still were human beings who had the same emotions, desires, intelligence, and curiosity that we do today. In fact, in some ways, they use their minds in a greater way than we do today, for they memorized everything. Alphabetic writing was invented in the same century as Genesis was penned. Before that, all communications passed down through generations and were memorized and recited. Genesis 1 bears the marks of something transmitted in that way. The sing-song repetitions make for an easily memorized rhythm, a structure to function as a mnemonic to remember their answer to the questions, who am I and how did I get here? Therefore, Genesis 1 is even more ancient than Moses. It was a song of the ancients, having been recited over and over countless times from generations of old, Moses just wrote it in the recently invented alphabetic fashion. This was ancient folks talking anciently. Now, logically, who should think that we modern folks should interpret it literally and modernly? Yet, we unknowingly do when we read it, critics especially. How careless is that? Today, we have geologists who have dug up ancient fossils of dinosaurs and other living things. I, I remember as a child discovering my first trilobite fossil in a limestone quarry. So they existed. One cannot deny that. Well, how does that fit with Genesis 1? Today we know what stars are. They are great balls of hydrogen, which are so massive that their gravity has caused their centers to collapse upon themselves with such force as to generate enough temperature and pressure to fuse hydrogen into helium in thermonuclear fusion reactions. Bigger and older stars fuse into heavier elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. Then, one day, they explode and seed the universe with their heavier elements, and then the process starts all over again with matter collecting gravitationally into future stars, planets, asteroids, and dust. Today, we peer into the depths of space with huge telescopes 
And behold, the beauties of the universe around us, full of gas and dust clouds, stars, planets, galaxies, and light. We even know about the heavenly stellar alchemy which can produce gold. Did the ancients know such things? No. So they were not addressed. So how can we criticize them if they did not know, and therefore at that time, have any need to express Genesis 1 in scientific terms? Yet here we are today trying to read it with a modern understanding. Is that even possible? Well, that's my task. You see, I stand in the, as an advocate for God. I'm a minister of the true faith, and therefore it is my job to make sense of such things. Oh, well, God help me. Another facet of interpreting the beginning of the book of Genesis is that it is full of figurative language. Why? Because that's how ancients spoke. It's especially characteristic of sacred text. We still have a need to understand it, but converting figurative language into the literal is very pliable, and it's dependent both upon what the literal facts are and the latitude of the figures. We now know some literal facts, not, not all facts, and we must admit that many of the things we now esteem as scientific fact are still, at best, theory. So the key questions in our modern quest to understand Genesis is, can the figurative concept A, that was so anciently framed, reach as far as encompassing the literal concept B as we now understand it? Is it possible to accurately convert Genesis from the terms of an ancient person's understanding into ours. Of course, hand in hand with all of this is the age-old argument about the existence of God. That's an all or nothing situation. Either God exists or he doesn't. Consequently, either the cosmos has come to be what it is by evolution and chance, or there is an intelligent design behind it. We human beings are hampered in our evaluation of such things because of our limitations of time and space. We only exist in the present and cannot move back into the past to see exactly what happened. And we are so incredibly small when compared to the universe. Well, that affects our perspective as well. But our modern telescopes do give us a viewpoint the ancients did not have. They are like a time machine in a way that lets us see years into the past for the further away things are the further back in time they are because it has taken so long for their light to reach us. Scientists say that they have not seen God in their telescopes. Consequently, I have to reiterate what I said in session one. From my standpoint in the present, I've seen too much to question God's existence. Too many miracles, too many signs, too many events which could only be spiritually induced have occurred for me. And so I don't question whether there is a spiritual realm or not. And many of you are probably the same way. So when it comes to Genesis 1, we already know God exists. So our challenge is how can we combine true science and the Bible and explain it simply? Well, there are several ways that Genesis 1 and 2 has been handled. Here's our next slide. <clears throat> there are several ways. The first way is the agnostic approach. This idea interprets Genesis 1 and 2 from a modern standpoint, comparing the Bible account with accepted scientific theory, and it rejects Genesis in the favor of science. Approach number two is the take-it-by-faith approach. 
This idea is the opposite of number one and rejects all science in favor of a modern, literal interpretation of Genesis. But it creates mind pictures of humans riding on the backs of dinosaurs. <laughs> number three, I advocate a third approach, which I call the blended approach. And it is true science does not contradict the Bible when it is interpreted accurately. Now, for true science, we have to see what true science is. Because science says the universe began with the Big Bang. The Bible says God created everything. To me, that fits. But what is true science? As I also said in session one, we're all familiar with the division which has occurred in religion. There are thousands of theological denominations among the world's religions made up of people who are convinced they are right and everything else is wrong. But actually the same is true in other fields. There's factions in politics, archaeology, medicine, and science which behave like religious denominations. There are ideas so pervasive and accepted that they prevent analysis or discourage it from concluding any other way, and thus the real truth may be overlooked. Here are some of the canons of the blended approach. Canon number one, realizing Terra centrism. In other words, the Bible wasn't written to angels. It was written to human observers on earth. And it deals only with the earth from the beginning to end. Now, yes, the heavens are mentioned, but always in reference to the earth, an observer on earth. Other worlds, other planets that we now know of that exist from the observation of our space-based telescopes are not mentioned at all. Genesis 1.1 just reads, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, let's put on our thinking caps. Let's put on our thinking caps. We have the challenge of thinking anciently and modernly simultaneously. When did God create the universe? Scientists say the Big Bang was about 13.8 billions, with a B, years ago. The Bible says, in the beginning. Does that fit? Good enough for me. But wait, is the earth 13.8 billion years old? No. Now it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Is the earth 13.8 billion years old? No. It's only about one third of that. So is the Bible wrong? Well, it depends upon how we understand in the beginning. Was that speaking of the very inception point of the beginning? Or could the language have enough latitude to mean during the beginning? Well, in does have that temporal meaning in Hebrew of during. So, it could still fit. God could still be spoken of in ancient terms as in the beginning, creating what ultimately, as we now know, has become the matter that's in the earth. You see how we did that? Now, am I making excuses for God? No. I'm accommodating my theory just like scientists accommodate theirs. Why? Because the language has that latitude. I haven't broken any rules. So everything in the Bible is spoken from the perspective of someone upon the earth. Terra centric. Terra is Latin for earth. Centric, a center of focus. Terra centric. Heaven is everything else above the earth. But wait, it says God created the heaven and the earth. But the word heaven there in Genesis 1.1 actually is plural in Hebrew. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Well, are there more than one heaven? There has to be. Why? Well, let's, let's put our thinking caps on again. We know that God is in heaven, right? Like it says so in Psalm 115. Take a look at Psalm 115. We'll begin reading verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens, plural. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Noses they have, but they don't even smell. They have hands, but they don't handle with them. And feet they have, but they walk not. Neither do they speak through their throat. <laughs> well, they that make them are like unto them. <laughs> so is everyone that trusts in them. So our God is in the heavens. Psalm 103, 19. It says, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. So God is in heaven. But which one? There is one heaven, which is the earth's atmosphere. That's documented in Zechariah. Look at Zechariah 8.12. Zechariah 8.12. It says, For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Now, which heaven does do come from? The atmosphere, you see? So that's one kind of heaven. The air, the atmosphere, anything above the ground, all right? But there's another heaven, which is outer space in the universe. But wait a minute. Could that have been the heaven that God was in when he created it? No. He had to be outside of what he created when he created it, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So there is another heaven outside of the heaven that's called the universe. Deuteronomy talks about that. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. So, there is a heaven that's the air, or the atmosphere of the earth. There is a heaven that is the universe. Then there is another dimension that God was in when he created everything else. Because he couldn't create where he was, was he? Could, could he? No. He had to be outside of it, you see? So that's one way we can look at Genesis 1-1 from the standpoint that there are multiple heavens. But wait a minute, because Hebrew is a Semitic language, there could be something else going on there because they have something called the majestic plural in Hebrew. When things are put in the plural to express their great magnitude. That is, an example of that is in Romans 12-1. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies, plural, of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your logical service. The word mercies is plural. To express God's great mercy. Like I say, it's so great. It'd give Tony the tiger a hernia. It's great. With that in mind, we could say that the word heaven 
in Genesis 1-1 is singular but great in magnitude. Now, if it's that, then it would take into account everything above the earth. That is, the heaven that God created. Not the heaven that was above it that he was in. All right? He was in a greater realm or dimension when he did so. Consequently, we will realize one more axiom. If God created the heaven and the earth, he's got to be greater than it. That makes sense, right? So, now we go back to slide number five. The second canon in the blended approach is the gap theory. There is a time gap between Genesis 1-1 and one two, which is allowed by the wording, and the earth became without form and void. So there is a there is an accommodation for all the time of the geologic and fossil record. Genesis one two says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, we know that ancient biblical Hebrew did not have a copular verb, is or was, like other Semitic languages. They don't have one either. Remember, now I'm not referring to modern Hebrew, because modern Hebrew borrowed some traits from European languages when it was revived in the 1700s and 1800s. Well, and one of those was a copular verb. Thankfully, the King James translators in the 1600s, before Hebrew was revived, when Hebrew still did not have a copular verb, they were honest enough to let us know what words they felt they needed to add to make English sense. So and, and that, those words weren't in the Hebrew text. So they put them in italics. So, the first word was, though, is not italicized. But the second word was there in Genesis 1-2 is italicized. So, do you know what that means? The second was, was from Italy. It was italicized, right? Oh, sorry. Well, it means that there was no word in the Hebrew there for the second word was. But, since the first word was, is not italicized, that means there is a word standing behind it in the Hebrew. But since there's no such word as was in Hebrew, it's got to be mistranslated. It's got to be something different. Well, it is the word became. So that is where we get the reading. And the earth became without form and void. It became that way. So that means there was a time period in between Genesis 1-1 in the beginning and Genesis 1-2. Well, how long was it? Well, it could be as long as you want. It could be billions of years. Some people believe the Bible says that God created the world in seven days. No, it doesn't say that. He, he repaired it in seven days. Why? Because it had already come into being in Genesis 1-1, but later became without form and void. Look at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and verse 3. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Here it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Well, first of all, the word worlds there, that's kind of odd. It actually is I own ages were framed, repaired by the word of God. So each age that the Bible is in, we'll talk about those in another session, but each one of them is a successive repair job to get things back to the way they were originally. Look at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 
45, verse 18. It says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Well, Genesis 1, 2 said, It became without form and void. Isaiah 45, 18 says that God created it not in vain. There's similar wording in the Hebrew in those two places. See, how could God, who is perfect, create something that would become imperfect? Well, hold that question. We'll get there, but maybe not in this session. But the Hebrew interlinear for Isaiah 45, 18 reads, He created it not in chaos. Okay, he created it, brahe, in chaos is theu, and not is la. Okay, that's in the Hebrew interlinear. The Hebrew interlinear for Genesis 1.1 reads, he, he created, it became, excuse me, in chaos and vacant. In chaos is that same word, theu, that shows up in Isaiah 45, 18, where God says he didn't do it. All right? So God did not create it in chaos. It became that way. God originally created it to become inhabited. So something happened. Well, what happened? Stay tuned. We'll talk about that in a future session. But that is the gap theory. Except I don't call it a gap, or or theory, because the proof is that right there in the Bible, it says what happened. Something occurred to put the world into chaos, and then God had to fix it. All right? The third canon, back to our chart, number five there, of the blended approach on slide five is that ancient terms were figurative. Explaining the ancient understanding wording with a modern true science perspective requires that we realize that the language of Genesis 1 and 2 is highly figurative. Thus, trees can be philosophical systems, as in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Fruit can be results or consequences as the results Eve experienced, etc. So consequently, days in Genesis 1 could be epochs. Do you understand? That'll be discussed in a future session too. So hold on to your thinking caps. Because look, like I said earlier, we have seen too much to doubt God's existence. Yes, but, yes, but, our detractors will say, how can you believe in God if he cannot be seen? And I say, yes, but, yes, but, right back to them, how can you believe in dark matter if it can't be seen? And they'll reply, because we see its gravitational effects. And then I'll say, well, I see God's effects every day. So I have just as much right to believe in the spiritual realm as they believe in dark matter, okay? In fact, dark matter might be in the spiritual realm. (laughs) So, do you want to have some proof about the existence of God? Do you? Well, here we go. Hold on to your hats. Scientists believe that the universe was created in the Big Bang. I believe God did that. How so? Because there is something called CMB radiation. Here on slide number six. CMB, cosmic microwave 
background radiation. The space.com website says, quote, the cosmic microwave background CMB is leftover radiation from the Big Bang or the time when the universe began. As the theory goes, when the universe was born, it underwent rapid inflation, expansion, and cooling. The CMB represents the heat left over from the Big Bang. Now, they called it heat, but it's energy waves, all right? You cannot see the CMB with your naked eye, space.com goes on to say. But it is everywhere in the universe. It is invisible to humans because it is so cold. Just 2.725 degrees above absolute zero, which is minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. This means its radiation is most visible in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. According to NASA, Spacecom goes on to say, CMB fills the universe and in the days before cable TV, every household with televisions could see it. They could see the afterglow of the Big Bang by turning their television to an in-between channel. And then that static on the screen, all those little pops and crackles, was CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. So that is what the Big Bang Theory is. It's a theory because it has not yet been proven conclusively but so far, it's the best thing we modern scientific humans have to explain the evidence. What evidence? The cosmic microwave background radiation that we here on Earth in our corner of the universe are awash in every moment. Now, this will take a bit. And you might need to listen to the recording a couple times to really appreciate it, but here we go. Let's look at slide number seven. Let me explain it so you can understand. Imagine that you are afloat in a swimming pool. So you're the earth, you see the earth there on the right, okay? A big rock drops into the pool. That's over there on the left, far away. Well, what's gonna happen? That's going to cause a wave, right, that radiates out and ultimately it'll reach you. So you see the wave there, okay? And what's that wave going to do? Well, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Okay? Now, if you were looking down upon this from above, that wave would be in the shape of a circle emanating from the place where the rock dropped in and getting larger and larger and larger, right? Can you see that in your mind's eye? I think we can because we've all thrown rocks in water and or we've all made cannonball dives off diving boards, right? So we know what that's like. So now, let's put that pool in the universe. This time, we're not throwing a rock in the pool, but instead we are on Earth and something explodes far away in the universe. And the light from that explosion is a wave of energy radiating outward the further it goes the colder it gets because it's getting larger and larger and dissipating as it goes but this is not just on the surface of a pool it is in three-dimensional space so what shape is that wave going to be a sphere right a bubble shaped wave expanding outward in the shape of a sphere, getting bigger and bigger and weaker and weaker. Now, I know the matter involved in an exploding star may make different shapes, like the Hubble telescope has shown us, due to the magnetic waves that are present. But for the sake of analogy, and for simplicity's sake, I'm just talking about the flash 
of the explosion, okay? Now, if that's getting too complicated, let's go back to the pool, all right? So here we are back in the pool. There we are on the earth, and that wave hits us, right? We experience the wave. It encounters us as it is expanding outward from the point of impact, all right? Now, how many times will that wave hit us? Once. That wave passes us once as it is expanding outward, right? So now, what if we get hit by another wave in that spot where we are in the lake, in the pool? What does that mean? It can mean only one thing. There was another rock thrown in somewhere, right? And that one radiated out from wherever it was and finally reached us too, right? That is what is happening with the cosmic microwave background radiation. We're being hit from waves on all time, all the time, from all sides. Did you feel it just now? No, <laughs> but if you had an old-fashioned TV, you could turn the dial between the stations and you could see it. You could see it hit that one little sparkle, that one little crackle on the screen. That's just one wave. The waves in, tra in space travel at the speed of light. So what caused that little bit of CMB, cosmic microwave background radiation, that just hit you just now, well, what caused it? The universe is about 14 billion years old. So that little wave, CMB wave, that hit you just now, came from something that exploded in space about 14 billion light years away. It's a wave that bubbled out from there and just now reached you. That wave emanated from the explosion in that point in space, 14 billion, with a B, light years away, and radiated out in a spherical shape, getting ever larger and larger and weaker and weaker and colder and colder, and a piece of it just passed by you, all right? A light year is how far light travels in a year, at 186,285 miles a second. So a light year is 5 trillion 878,625,370,000 miles. That's how far a light year is. So for 14 billion of those, that place that, that just hit you with its CMB wave was 82 trillion billion miles away. So a light year is pretty heavy, isn't it? That is at the bottom of the screen. 82 with 24 zeros after it. That's how far away that little wave that just hit you came from. Where is that? I don't know. <laughs> All I know is, is it's way far away. Except there's a problem. Look at slide number eight. Because we're not just being hit by one. And it's not just coming from one direction. We're constantly being hit by the CMB waves, not just once, all the time. And it's coming from all directions, all 360 degrees horizontally and 360 degrees vertically, X, Y, and Z axes, every direction possible. Ooh, ah, e, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, from all sides, nonstop. So what does that mean? Well, in the pool, it would mean more rocks have been thrown in the pool and their waves are hitting us from all directions, except we're in space. So that means that more explosions on all sides of us, 82 trillion billion miles away occurred and their waves are just now hitting us from all sides after traveling all that distance. So let's, let's go over that again so you understand. Imagine a bunch of rocks being dropped in the pool 
all around you. What will happen? You'll be hit by waves from all sides, right? Now put that in space, three-dimensional. We're being hit with waves from all sides, all around. Those waves are 14 billion years old. The explosions came all that distance and are just now reaching us. That is from the Big Bang. Okay? Now, because CMB is from all sides, that means the Big Bang did not occur in one spot 14 billion years ago. It's not like on the left. All right? It wasn't just one spot, because then there would just be one wave that hit us. This CMB is hitting us all the time. So the Big Bang came from all over, all at once. Like on the right, that kind of explosion. That was the Big Bang. How can I say that? Because we are constantly awash in the CMB radiation that's hitting us from every direction in three dimensions all the time. So the Big Bang exploded all over in the whole universe all at once. That's impossible. Well, yes, that is impossible by all the laws of physics that we know and attested to be true. Yet here is the evidence of that radiation hitting us from all directions, emanating from points 14 billion light years away. And the next one that hits you is 14 billion plus one second. And the next one that hits you is 14 billion plus two seconds. And the next one that hits you is 14 billion but plus three seconds. And they're all getting here one after another after another from an explosion that exploded all over the universe all at once. You can't discount that. An astrophysicist cannot explain it or they will not explain it. But I can. I can explain why what they won't. What happened? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's actually simple. We are in this box called the universe where the dimensions of space and time rule. Something outside of our box shook it. Something infinitely more powerful than anything inside the box affected everything inside the box simultaneously. Something infinitely larger than the box caused something to happen all over inside the box simultaneously. <laughs> Hello? God is knocking. Hello? Hello? Do you know I'm here? Many astrophysicists won't acknowledge that fact, yet it is staring them in the face. Nothing inside of the box could make it explode all over simultaneously. According to the laws of physics, we know nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So we light a fuse and the fuse travels to the bomb and it explodes. We push a button and the electricity travels down the wire to the detonator. But nothing we know of could make all the universe explode simultaneously. Only something from outside of the box, something from another dimension, 
other than space-time could do that. The cosmic microwave background evidence is irrefutable. I am willing to answer, Hi God, (laughs) I see you. Will you answer with me? Will you see that he must be? Who did that? God did. Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The cosmic microwave background radiation is the proof. The astrophysicists know that something had to do that, but many of them refuse to say what did because they don't know or won't say. No scientist has a viable theory for what preceded the Big Bang. So, they have no right to look down their nose at us who say, God did it. God did it. Something infinitely powerful and everywhere present did that. Well, that's two out of three for God, but wait a minute, just we have to add a little intelligence, right? Because what happened was everywhere present, it was also timeless. Whatever acted upon the box of the universe, or might we more accurately say, upon the space-time continuum of the universe, the space-time dimension of the universe, was from a super dimension in which there is no space nor time. So when it comes to space, God's already been there. And when it comes to time, he's already done that because he inhabits eternity. Look at Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15, first part of the verse says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. God inhabits eternity. He is everywhere present throughout eternity simultaneously. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> How? because he's from a super dimension outside of our universe. He had to be there when he created it. We are limited to a place where height, width, and length, and time rule. He isn't. So that is why he can have foreknowledge. For he is timeless. That is why he is all-knowing. Because he's everywhere present throughout all time, simultaneously. He can look at everything all at once. Therefore, he has seen it all. How could he not have foreknowledge then? All of that reasoning flows from the evidence of the cosmic microwave background. Something everywhere present, all-powerful, and eternal, indeed, is out there. So no one there can criticize me for calling that God. Hello, Elohim. Now we have another concept that must be clarified. Elohim is a plural noun, but the verb create, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the verb create is singular. Now, some people think that since Elohim is plural, that God is a plurality. And that idea takes two forms. The first option I've dealt with in the One God of Original Christianity class. Our God, Elohim, is not a trinity. He is one. He is a singular entity. How so? Well, the verb created is singular. Therefore, Elohim is a singular entity. Our God is one God. When Moses instituted the equivalent 
of the Hebrew Pledge of Allegiance, which is slide 11 here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, that's what it meant. This was spoken in a time and a context in which all the other pagan religions had trinities. Now, of course, the hardest thing in the universe <laughs> often is to get someone to give up their error, especially if it is theological. But I'm not going to make fun of people who believe that way, nor am I going to try to intimidate them, because neither of those things are conducive to them changing their minds. <laughs> they believe that way because they were taught that way. And they believe that way because they trust their minister. Their minister is a good guy. Why would he steer them wrong, right? The only thing I can do is invite them to consider my proof. Often when I bring up the Shema, and that's what this is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Here is Shema, or Shema in Hebrew. That's like the Pledge of Allegiance for Hebrews in Deuteronomy 6.4. Yahweh, our Elohim, is one Yahweh. Now, Trinitarians will say that that word one can be a grouping like a clump of grapes. Ekad is the Hebrew word. And so they use that argument to negate the singular solitary meaning for the word one, Ekad, there. They bend it to their purpose. But our God is one God. He's not a pantheon like in Egypt or Mesopotamia or Rome or Greece, that word one is echad in Hebrew, and it means one, single, or solitary. We have one God, a single God, a solitary God, no other. For the Orthodox Christians to impose their one bunch meaning, echad, on echad, is anachronistic. They want to project an idea from the 4th century A.D., back almost 2,000 years onto Moses' time to say that Akkad can mean a compound unity, whatever that is. Anachronistic, that means the time doesn't match. It's imposing modern ideas back upon ancient people. It's changing the rules after the game's already been decided. <laughs> it's like telling the King James translators they can't use thee and thou. That's what anachronistic means. They want to impose different word meanings back on Hebrew. And so they cite Numbers 13.23, where the spies brought back one cluster of grapes. Now, how many clusters was it? One. But they still say it was a cluster. So they claim that one can mean a compound unity. So you know what I did? I looked up all the occurrences of Echad. And I tried plugging the meaning of, quote-unquote, compound unity into all of them. There are about 700 occurrences of Akkad in the Old Testament. Well, guess what? <laughs> compound unity doesn't fit. In fact, there are very few figurative occurrences, like in Genesis where it says the twain shall become one flesh. That's two becoming one. So there, there's something compound there, all right? Or when Jacob served an initial seven years for Rachel, and it seemed to him but a few, a cod, but one days. It was seven years, but it seemed like one days. It seemed like one day, because that's, that's how it says it in Hebrew. Well, that's figured it. So they say Deuteronomy 6.4 means compound unity. The Lord, our God, is a one-bunch Lord. <laughs> well, Echad, like I said, is used almost 700 times in the Old Testament, and I could count on one hand the number of times that Echad, by some way or another, could imply compound unity, like they want it to mean. So, their claim is illogical. How could a meaning that occurs less than 1% of the time is the meaning that is used in such an important phrase as Deuteronomy 6? I think not. I don't think that God via the prophet Moses 
would use such an obtuse meaning there. I mean, it's a confession of faith, isn't it? Aren't those things clear and concise? No ambiguity there. No exceedingly rare meanings allowed. So when we place it in its historical context, I think we can see it can be none other than one, one, single, solitary God, not compound unity whatsoever. Because it's stated in opposition to going after other gods, and those other gods are trinities. All the other gods at that point, the Egyptians, the pantheon of Egypt was a trinity, and also the, the, the Palestinians. And all those gods of Egypt were discredited by the plagues. So I think Moses certainly strictly opposed all references to idolatry. But there's another option, which is believed by some, because they think Elohim is plural for another reason. And that is that our God, they say, is part of a committee of gods that together rule the universe. Well, if that were true, why didn't Jesus clue us in? Jesus didn't speak of anything like that, did he? This comes from an incorrect interpretation of Psalm 92. Please turn to Psalm 92. We'll finish up here pretty quick now. Psalm 82, verse 1. It says, Elohim stands in the congregation of the mighty, El, the mighty ones. He judges among the gods, and that's Elohim. They say, look, there's a whole big bunch of Elohims out there. And our Elohim, he's plural because he's one of them. He's in that committee, in the congregation of the mighty. That's what they say. Well, Psalm 82 goes on to say, How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Say law. So God Elohim is judging the other Elohim because they are inferior. They're screwing up. He says, verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, you are Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, Elohim, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all things. Now, see, some interpret this as our God, Elohim, being in a congregation of other gods. But the word El, the congregation of the mighty, El, mighty ones, in verse 1 can either be God himself, or El can refer to devils, or El can even refer to mighty men. Just do a study of L, you'll see that. And it can be easily seen when you do that study that most of the time when L is used of God, there is a qualifying adjective or phrase that specifies that the L, the mighty one spoken of, is God. Like the L of hosts, or the almighty L, or the L of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, that's God. But there are other places that the L is a devil, and there are other places that the L are mighty men. So that's why it needs the qualifying adjective to make sure that it's talking about God. Okay? Even Brown Driver Briggs points that out. So verse 2 says that these Elohim, whoever they were, are unjust. They're sinful. They're screwed up. So it should be obvious that they're not part of some group on par with our God, Elohim. Back in ancient times, the truth is, they called judges, men who were judges, Elohim. We call them your honor. Well, that's a cultural thing. The Psalm says they needed to defend the poor and fatherless. They needed to do justice for the afflicted and the needy. And that they all die as men. I think that fits with Elohim in Psalm being human judges in all the other places. All right? Now, I could get into an argument with Hebrew scholars 
who insist that the nuances of this passage promote the other idea of the committee. But instead, I'm going to rely upon the authority and the words of Jesus who quoted this very psalm. And how did he interpret it? I think that should settle it. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus was talking and he said, I and the Father are one. And then the Jews took up stones to stone him. And Jesus answered them saying, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered saying, For a good work we stone you not. But for blasphemy, because you, being a man, makes yourself God. Verse 34, John 10, 34. Jesus answered them, and he quotes Psalm 82, all right? Verse 6. He says, Jesus answered them and said, John 10, 34. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? That's Psalm 82, 6. If you call them gods on whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. So how did Jesus interpret it? He interpreted it that the Elohim were human judges. I rest my case. Right? <laughs> it's not a committee. Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, I've talked about this verse in other classes. So Elohim is not a trinity. Elohim is not a committee. He is God the creator. He has many names. I covered them in the one God of original Christianity class. Elohim is one of his names and it emphasizes his role as the almighty creator. Elohim is not the plural of El, mighty one. The plural form of El is Elim. The Im, I am suffix is like S suffix in English. So since their plurals are different, they are separate words. Now, of course, they may be related. They all have the E-L in them. They may come from a common stem, but they are not the same word. The Hebrew word Eloah, which is Strong's number 433, is the singular of Elohim, not El. What's interesting is that Eloah usually is regarding a heathen god, and so it is given in the singular our God, Elohim, is put in the plural to designate his greatness. It's the same thing as the word heaven, being plural in Genesis 1-1, to emphasize its magnitude. <laughs> this is funny. Consider this. Eloha is in the singular, designating heathen gods that are trinities, but our singular God, Elohim, is put in the plural because he's not a trinity. <laughs> wow he's put in the plural for majesty so this is why this session is titled hello Elohim bless you